Hello there and welcome back to this video series on bilingualism. In this episode we're going to talk about bilingual language production. The experiments that I'll talk about are described in chapter 3 of Conjon and these the psycholinguistics of bilingualism and if you're interested in the details of one particular study or several studies I would recommend that you have a look at the chapter and look up the actual paper uh, from which the study is taken. Yeah, so get the book, look up the reference and you'll find the paper. If you're lucky, it's online somewhere and you can take a look at the actual tables and figures and results and whatnot. Okay, let's go. Um, for this video, I have a bunch of questions that I want to focus on. First, how do bilinguals manage speech production when there are constantly two languages to choose from or even more? You can imagine how that can be a distraction, yeah, how that can incur additional processing costs. And the question is, how is this kept in check? <clears throat> Conversely, what are the contexts or the situations when bilinguals should choose just one language and stick with that? And how does that work? Yeah? How can bilinguals focus uh, on just one language and deactivate their other languages? Does that work? Um, so when bilinguals speak one of their languages, does it mean that the other ones are deactivated or somehow dormant or are they activated just a little bit? We'll find out more about that. And lastly, uh, bilingual speech production also has a social dimension. So we have to ask ourselves, when is it socially appropriate to uh, mix languages? When, in what contexts do bilinguals switch back and forth between their languages, uh, include borrowings, and so on and so forth. Right. So um, just as a general introduction to this video, uh, I need to see, say a few general things about speech production <clears throat> uh, from a general psycholinguistic perspective. So there's a rich uh, literature from psycholinguistics that has established um, a broad three-stage model of speech production that breaks down into the phases of conceptualization, formulation, and articulation. Okay, conceptualization uh, is basically you thinking of something to say. You have an idea, uh, a thought, a feeling, something that uh, at that stage is not even linguistic yet. Yeah? It's just a concept, it's an idea that you may want to verbalize, put into words at some stage. That stage would be the second stage here, formulation, where you try to put an idea into words that have a certain morphosyntactic structure as well. Yeah? So formulation in that stage, you select words from your mental lexicon, you put them into a morphosyntactic structure. Uh, so that's where all the grammar uh, comes in. And then the third stage is the articulation stage, where you transform this linguistic structure that you have formed in your mind and uh, transform it into sounds that other people can hear. Right. Um, so when we're looking at this three-stage model, we can ask ourselves some rather interesting questions with regard to bilingual speech production. Namely, uh, in which of the three stages do bilinguals select the base language they want to use? Yeah? So if you have an idea and you are bilingual, is that idea already tied to some language or is that something that you decide further down the line? Yeah? When we're looking at code switches, we can ask ourselves, in what stage are code switches planned and executed? Is that already somehow part of conceptualization? Is it part of formulation? Uh, what about articulation? Is uh, code switching somehow linked to uh, the, the, the process of you know, moving your articulators in a certain way? So these are questions that we'll revisit uh, over the course of this video. Okay, let's start with a big question, namely, is the production of monolingual speech selective or non-selective? So when bilinguals speak in one of their languages, like I am now, yeah, uh, does it mean that the other languages are somehow deactivated? Well, uh, it would seem that this is rather useful, yeah, so for instance, when I'm speaking to monolingual hearers, there's really just one language that I need, or when I read, a monolingual text, <clears throat> uh, having 
my other languages in mind all the time, that would be a distraction. That would mean additional processing cost. Also, when I write in one language, it uh, would be sort of <clears throat> counterproductive to constantly be confused by you know other words and other structures that relate to the other languages that I'm speaking. So is bilingual speech production selective or non-selective? Um, okay, here's a first example of a of an experimental study that has been done that uh, tried to get at this question through uh, the paradigm of a picture naming task. So a picture naming task is simply what it is. You show people a picture and the task that you give them is to name that picture as quickly as possible. Yeah. So <clears throat> when you show this to a Swiss person, they will say Matterhorn. Yeah, but you, <clears throat> here uh, there were um, Dutch English bilinguals and uh, their task was simply to say that okay that's a mountain yeah right uh, so the task was to describe the picture in English and because just showing the picture and asking for uh, the right response would be a bit too easy and also wouldn't tell us much about this question of language selectiveness um, the experimenters made it just a little bit harder for the participants. Namely, simultaneous or roughly simultaneous to seeing the picture, there was a sound that the participants heard. And actually, not just one type of sound, but there were four different conditions. So people saw this picture and um, in different conditions, the sound that they heard simultaneously um, was of different types. So <clears throat> the first condition is what the experimenters called the Dutch phonologically related condition. So um, simultaneously to the picture there was a sound that came on and um, in this condition, so when you see the mountain, there was a Dutch word that was played over uh, loudspeakers and that word was mau. Yeah, that is Dutch that means sleeve but you can see it's phonologically related. It sounds the same or very similar uh, as the first syllable of mountain. Okay, uh, so there's potential for confusion there, right? In the second condition, uh, there was another Dutch word that uh, was played as a possible distractor, and that word was semantically related to uh, the, the referent of the picture. So. Here we had things like dal, yeah, that means valley, and valleys are related to mountains, so there's a semantic relation between the picture and the uh, auditory stimulus. Uh, then in the third condition, there was an unrelated Dutch word, um, so <clears throat> a word that translates as, as candle, yeah, well, you could say, well, there, there is a tenuous relation between candles and mountains. If you're going to a mountain, maybe you need to pack some candles. Uh, maybe mountains make you think of, I don't know, snow, and snow makes you think of Christmas, and Christmas makes you think of candles. Anyway, the semantic relation is not as tight as between mountain and valley. So this is the unrelated condition. And then lastly, so this is the interesting condition here, uh, there was a uh, <clears throat> Dutch distractor that sounded a lot like the referent of the picture in Dutch. Yeah? So the, the word here was berm, which means verge. <clears throat> and uh, even though verge doesn't have anything to do with mountain uh, and berm doesn't sound anything like mountain, it's related to Dutch ber, which, well, is basically the translation of mountain. Okay, so what the experimenters hypothesized was that in this fourth condition, hearing a word that sounds pretty much like uh, the word for mountain in Dutch should make it harder for people to say mountain in response to this picture. Yeah? Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's look at the results. Uh, the results are kind of complicated because not only are there these four different conditions, also uh, the 
timing of picture and sound was varied a little bit. So what you see in this table here uh, are the four conditions. Yeah, so the phonological Dutch condition, mau, um, then berm, then the semantic condition, and then the unrelated condition. <clears throat> and in the columns, you have different versions of the experiments that basically tell you that uh, the sequence of the sound and the picture were varied in different ways. So uh, what you see here um, <clears throat> as the abbreviation SOA, that means stimulus onset asynchrony. And that tells you which came first, the picture or the sound. And I would like us to focus first on the results that you see in the red frame here, where both the sound and the picture came on at the same time. Okay, what we see here when uh, the stimulus onset asynchrony was zero milliseconds, um, the hypothesis was actually confirmed, namely that um, the slowest responses were uh, triggered by the phono-Dutch condition where we have the uh, Dutch word berm, which sounds like berg, which means mountain. So when speakers hear that, yeah, the Dutch word for mountain gets activated and it is harder for the speaker to activate the English word mountain. Yeah, that is the basic result here. Conversely, uh, the fastest reactions uh, were in the unrelated condition. So uh, the, the Dutch word for candle, it doesn't sound like mountain, it doesn't have any semantic relation to a mountain, so that allows you to um, produce mountain reasonably fast. Okay, so, so far so good, you might say. <clears throat> Let's look at uh, the condition on the very right, where there was a stimulus onset asynchrony of 150 milliseconds so that the picture actually came first. So when the picture came first and um, 150 milliseconds later, there was a sound that was played, yeah, mau, berm, dal, or kars. Um, now suddenly the dal gives you the slowest responses and mau, gives you the fastest responses. And the, the BAM um, phono-Dutch condition doesn't actually do much damage anymore. Yeah? So this indicates that um, the whole question of is one language active uh, or is it deactivated is a very time sensitive one. Yeah? So 150 milliseconds into a word, uh, into a picture naming task, uh, all kinds of processes have already taken place so that a distractor like BERM doesn't do much damage anymore. Yeah? Okay, by contrast, the MAO, which actually corresponds to the sounds that the participants had to produce, uh, that actually helps the speaker produce the right word. So these are the, the, the fastest responses in this condition. Um, okay. So that's already interesting, <clears throat> and it um, allows us to conclude that bilingual speech production is really dynamic. It ranges between fully monolingual and fully bilingual, and um, it's very time sensitive. We'll see further examples of this. Um, so both selective language production and non-selective non uh, production are possible, and how bilinguals do it depends on the activation levels of each language. So if you're prepared to use a language, you do it fast. If you have to, if you're surprised by it somehow, it takes you longer. And that means that there's a continuum from what we call the monolingual mode to bilingual mode. It's not a clean switch that activates or deactivates a language, but rather languages can be active to different degrees. That's a point that we'll see over and over uh, in this video. So, um, <clears throat> the results um, from this experiment were taken as evidence for largely non-selective production. So, even when just one language is called for, bilinguals uh, 
tend to have both of their languages activated. Yeah. But there's a criticism that you could level at this conclusion, namely the experiment, well, it asked you to give a response in English, but at the same time, it bombarded you with all sorts of Dutch sounding words. So, um, Gaujean in the book makes the point that, well, these stimuli actually activated Dutch with the distractors, <clears throat> so that it's really hard to tell uh, whether this is any evidence for or against selective or non-selective language processing. So this in some way relates to uh, what has been called the observer's paradox elsewhere. Uh, the observer's paradox <clears throat> means that uh, it's hard to study something objectively because the act of studying it typically influences the phenomenon that you're looking at a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so by setting up a task that tests whether production is selective or non-selective, uh, the researchers already activate both languages and that makes it very hard to find evidence for selective language processing. Okay, but people have tried nonetheless and um, so Hermans et al. came back with an experiment from 2011, again using Dutch-English bilinguals, and this time the task that they used was a phoneme detection task. And the phoneme detection task is that you show people a picture and you ask them, is the sound B in the word that corresponds to this picture? Yeah. And since this is a bottle, the correct answer is yes, there is a B in bottle. Okay. Um, Right. <clears throat> now, as in the last experiment, uh, there were four conditions that made this task a little more complex and that allows us to conclude a few things about language selective and non-selective processing. So the four conditions were such that there were stimuli where the sound that was asked for was there in the onset. So you show someone a picture of a bottle, you ask them, is the sound B in this word? And obviously, yes, uh, there is a B, so the correct answer would be yes. Um, you could also show people a picture of a bottle and ask them, is the sound T in this word? Yeah, that's also correct. Yeah, there's a T in bottle. Uh, however, the T comes later in the word. It's not the onset, it's something um, in the middle or at the right edge of the word. So it's not as easy, not as quickly to establish. So, well, uh, we'll, we'll see how people did in that condition. <clears throat> and now for uh, the, the, the interesting condition, the third condition uh, was called the Dutch distractor condition. And it showed people a bottle and asked, is the sound F in this word? And of course, there's no F in bottle. So the correct answer would be no. However, there is a Dutch word corresponding to bottle that starts with an F. Yeah, so here we have a competitor who has an F in the onset. So that would be hypothesized to be somewhat distracting. And then in the fourth condition, um, people were shown a bottle and uh, just asked, uh, is the sound like P in this word? <clears throat> so there's no P in bottle and there's also no Dutch uh, corresponding lexical element that would have a P somehow. So that is called the unrelated condition. Right. If you want to, uh, you can pause the video here and uh, think a little bit for yourself. Which condition do you think was the easiest and which one was the hardest? Yeah. Okay. I'll continue. And uh, here are the results. Um, I suspect that many of you uh, correctly thought that the first condition is actually the easiest one. So in experiments, usually uh, saying yes, identifying something as belonging to a category or instantiating a truth rather than a non-truth, uh, that goes a little bit faster. And here um, establishing that bottle has a B in it takes people just around 740 milliseconds and they say yes. Um, if you ask them is there the sound T 
in this word. That takes them a little longer, but still, they do it. Yeah, 860-ish milliseconds. That's not terrible either. Now, if we look at the two no conditions, the Dutch distractor and the unrelated, um, well, both of them are sort of on a par. Yeah, and that raises the question, okay, what goes on there? Yeah, what, what's happening? Uh, is it that people are <clears throat> somehow distracted by an interlingual competitor? Or is it just that it takes time to uh, establish that really no sound in bottle corresponds to an F or a P? In order to find out uh, what exactly happens there, <clears throat> Hermann said, I'll... Uh, created a new version of the experiment and the new version included filler trials with Dutch English cognate words. So cognate words are words that go back to the same historical source and that look rather similar across languages. So for instance um, um, the, the words for, for moon and mouse and bread in the Germanic languages uh, tend to correspond very neatly. Okay, so in English and Dutch, uh, you see that the words are basically the same. Yes, the vowels have changed a little, but other than that, they're identical. So um, the second version of the experiment then included uh, elements like this. So showing people a moon, asking is the sound M in this word, uh, showing them a picture of a mouse, uh, asking is the sound S in this word, showing people a loaf of bread and asking is the sound B in this word. Okay, and this obviously activated the interlingual links between Dutch and English in these bilinguals. Okay, now let's look at the four original conditions again and let's see how this changed in the experiment with cognate fillers. So what you see here is that this additional activation of Dutch actually uh, teased out a difference between condition 3 and condition 4. Namely, condition 3 now becomes the hardest in relative terms. Yeah? So as soon as you uh, activate Dutch beyond a certain threshold, um, this now is the hardest condition and uh, solving the unrelated condition is easier in relative terms. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, back to the question of selective or non-selective language production. The continuum from monolingual mode to bilingual mode is dynamic. Uh, languages can be activated to greater or lesser degrees and this continuum is very sensitive. So very subtle stimuli, like, like hearing a word in English that sounds a little bit similar in Dutch, these cognates, that can already have the effect of some activation that, that changes how people uh, situate themselves on this continuum from monolingual mode to bilingual mode. Okay, um, there are a number of language mode studies that are discussed in chapter 3. I'll just go through a couple of them. Um, one study by Grosjean studied French-English bilinguals and had them describe cartoons. And you see um, there were two types of cartoons, uh, American um, Tweety-type cartoons and uh, the, the French, I think, is Petit Nicolas. Um, and uh, well, these, these French-English bilinguals were retelling cartoons in French to three different groups of speakers. Um, so. <clears throat> uh, this, this was done in the US and uh, there were three types of hearers. Uh, group A, newcomers to the US uh, with relatively little knowledge of English. <clears throat> Hearer B, uh, French teachers with some knowledge of English. And then Hearer C, uh, French speakers working for an American company with very solid knowledge of English. Yeah. So basically from ABC, it is a function of how much English do these hearers know. And it turns out that when you give people this kind of task, uh, speakers are very sensitive to their interlocutor. 
and they are aware that they can switch more, that they can use more borrowings um, when they have someone who is really competent in that other language. Yeah? So code switching, I can tell you that generally, is very much a hallmark of very proficient bilingual usage. If you uh, see someone code switching a lot, well, that means that they're just using uh, the different languages on a regular basis, and um, that's how it happens. All right, so the number of borrowings, the number of code switches vary significantly across the three hero types, also across the two uh, stimulus types. So the more competent the hero is in the uh, different language, the more switches to that language the speaker will produce. Okay, so code switching has a social dimension. That's the basic take-home point from this study. Um, now, so there are different factors that affect language activation. Language proficiency, as we just saw, that's, that's one big point. So the greater the mastery of a language, the stronger the activation. <clears throat> also, the context influences people. Um, the greater the presence of a language in the context, the stronger its activation. The topic of conversation plays a role. So if I'm talking about work-related stuff, most of my work happens in English, well, English has a stronger level of activation and I'm more likely to break into a code switch or use some borrowing um, from English. <clears throat> and also the conversational task as such can play a role. So if my conversational task requires me to translate between two languages, well, then unsurprisingly, uh, that language will be more strongly activated than if there is no uh, requirement to translate. Okay, so I've already mentioned the term code switching a couple of times, so let's uh, be a bit more explicit about code switching. <clears throat> um, one question that we need to talk about is this. Does language switching take time? Uh, is there a cognitive cost with regard to code switching? In the last video, we saw something that uh, was called the base language effect, uh, which seemed to suggest that, at least in language processing, there is some cost associated with language switching. And um, today, we're going to see experiments that suggest that this holds also true in language production. And for that, I have prepared a little task for you um, the task is going to be French-English, so um, if you are a bilingual in different languages, you can still participate. You just have to pick two different languages, you have to mute the sound of the video uh, and just uh, take different languages. But let me explain how it works with French and English. So the game we're going to play is the name the number game. So when the number appears in a blue box, you have to use French. So when you see, uh, well, this little blue box and then the two digits in that, you have to say Disneuf. And when the number appears in a red box, you have to use English. So if you see the second example there, you have to say as fast as you can, 21. Okay, are you ready? Because we're going to start now. Three, two, one, go. Trente-deux, dix-sept, soixante-trois, thirty-two, eighty-one, vingt-sept, dix-huit, eleven. Okay, there we are. So that's basically the task. Not that hard to do. Yeah. Um, but if you if you have to do that as fast as you can, uh, there'll still be the occasional error that you make. Now, uh, here are some results. Um, <clears throat> so, um, you see response times um, across uh, four different conditions. So, there were non-switches, where basically, uh, so from um, 27 to 18, that's a non-switch. Yeah? The first is French, the second is French, no switch. Um, <clears throat> Also in the L2, let's say uh, you have two red numbers following each other uh, and there, 
yeah, no switch between those two. Um, and here on the right hand side of the graph, you see the switch condition, switch to L2 and switch to L1. Uh, okay, so from uh, 81 to 27, if you are a French native speaker, that would be a switch to L1. <clears throat> uh, let's say you're an English native speaker um, who knows French, then you would have uh, D3 and 11, that would be a switch to your L1. Okay, so what can we see in this graph? What we can see is perhaps non surprisingly that the non switch response times are faster. Yeah, so when you have several red boxes in a row or several blue boxes in a row, then uh, you can really uh, speed up and uh, deliver quick answers. When you have to switch, that's where it gets interesting. Now, the surprising result that you see in this graph is that it actually takes longer to switch into your L1 than to switch into an L2. Yeah? So when you see a number from uh, your native language, uh, you answer that, and then you see one in the L2, that takes a little longer, but not that long. However, when you have just answered a number uh, from the L2, and then you're supposed to answer a number from the L1, that's what seems to be really complicated and effortful. And that's kind of surprising, right? So why should switching back into your L1 be a difficult task? If you want to, you can stop the video here and, and think a little bit about that. Um, but, well, okay, I'll continue because there are more results that seem to confirm that this is actually uh, the case, not only in this experiment, but more broadly. Um, so here's a different version of the same kind of logic. Uh, again, the experimental paradigm is a picture naming task. Name the picture as quickly as possible. And uh, um, this time, uh, the experiment was done with two types of bilinguals, Spanish-Catalan bilinguals and Korean-Spanish bilinguals. So the Korean word for mountain is sun and the Spanish word for mountain is montaña. And again, what you see in the graph, uh, the, the upper graph shows you that, okay, if you stay in the L1 or in the L2 in no switch contexts, that goes relatively fast. But if you switch to the L1, that's where the music is. Yeah, so that is really hard. So this as uh, people switching to their L1 in the um, <clears throat> um, picture description task. Uh, the way this was done, uh, I should say, was exactly as with the numbers. So if you saw a picture in a blue frame, that means say it in your L1. And if you see it in a red frame, that means uh, say it in your L2. Yeah, same thing as with the numbers. So, uh, and it's not just something that works in uh, Germanic languages or uh, in the European languages. So here we have uh, Korean Spanish bilinguals and with them it's the exact same story. So take home message, switching back into your L1 is more difficult. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> um, I've mentioned the term code switching a bunch of times, but I still haven't explained really well what it is and how it works. Now, um, one thing that I want to say is that uh, code switching is really a very systematic phenomenon. It's not like you can switch uh, languages and mix them up any way you like, but rather uh, there is a system to this. So, um, <clears throat> well, here you see an English sentence, I told him that so that he would bring it fast, and the Spanish equivalent, the Spanish translation. And um, if you have an English-Spanish bilingual handy, uh, you can ask them, okay, can you code switch anywhere in that sentence? And uh, you can play around with these two sentences, and the answer is going to be, well, you can do a lot, but you can't do everything. Yeah, there are limits to code switching, there are constraints, and these constraints we need to 
talk about. Um, <clears throat> so uh, what we will see in experiments, what has been established also in, uh, elsewhere, is that there are certain permissible switch points and there are points that are not good transition points for code switches. The most important constraint that I want to talk about is the so-called equivalence constraint. The equivalent, equivalence constraint says that code switches can occur at points where the combination of L1 and L2 elements does not violate a syntactic rule of either language. That is, um, translated into plain English, that means that code switches are okay as long as the result conforms to the grammatical rules of either language. Okay, so that means if you have two languages that work syntactically more or less in the same way, uh, that means that, okay, you'll be relatively free to switch at more or less any point you like. However, when you have languages with different syntactic patterns, <clears throat> uh, so for instance, if you know a little bit of German, German has these funny word order patterns and subordinate clauses where the verb goes to the very end of the sentence. English doesn't have that so much. So um, that would mean that, well, when you have a situation like this, it becomes more complicated to find a good point for your switch when you're using English and German at the same time. Okay, we'll see concrete examples of this. Um, so here are some versions of code switches that work and code switches that don't work. Yeah. So, <clears throat> uh, so if we look at the three code switches that are okay, so you can switch into Spanish after I told him that. Yeah. Um, you can switch into Spanish after I told him that so that he. Uh, and you can switch into Spanish after I told him that so that he would bring it. Now, what does not work, what's not okay, is uh, to switch into Spanish after I told. Yeah? And that is because uh, you see the order of verb and object in um, the first three words, English I told him and the corresponding Spanish, uh, le, that is the pronoun, and so it comes before the verb, not after the verb. And so that means that if you uh, start your sentence with I told and continue with le, you're producing a word order that goes against the rules of Spanish syntax. And that is something that goes against the equivalence constraints. Yeah? Your code switch should make syntactic sense in both of the languages. When you code switch, do it in such a way that you don't create phrases that are strange in one or both languages. Yeah? That's the basic take-home point of the equivalence constraint. Okay, um, you don't need to take my word for it that it works like this. There's actually experimental evidence uh, that looked at this, uh, this time on the basis of an experiment that involved uh, Dutch-English bilinguals. So Dutch <clears throat> also has uh, funny word orders that are not found to the same extent in English. And uh, here we have different syntactic environments that ask for these word orders. Okay, let's start with the first pair of examples. Um, so we have an English sentence that starts with everyone is happy because. And after because, you expect the clause in SVO, subject, verb, object, word order. So everyone is happy because John kisses Mary. Maybe they've been in love for a long time, but were too shy to admit to that. And so now finally uh, they've made up their mind. And so everyone's happy because John kisses Mary. Fine, SVO. Uh, this works in exactly the same way in Dutch, yeah. <clears throat> but in uh, pairs two and three, things are a little different. So uh, let's take the English uh, example two first. Peter points at a picture on which John kisses Mary. SVO. Yeah, English is kind of boring in this regard. No matter what syntactic context 
SVO is the name of the game. But in Dutch, yeah, when you have this kind of structure, uh, Peter points at a picture on which suddenly the grammar of Dutch asks you to use a different word order, namely subject, object, verb, with the verb at the very end. Yeah. Okay. Uh, to make matters even worse, uh, in example three, we have sentences with an initial time adverbial. So, yesterday, and again in English, it's the same old boring story. Yesterday, John kissed Mary. S-V-O. Yeah, but in Dutch, <laughs> after yesterday, the verb is asked for. Yeah, so yesterday kissed John Mary. Okay, why, uh, why, why do you need to know about this? Why, how does this figure in the experiment? Well, okay, so this you've already seen. Um, the idea would be that <clears throat> In contexts where both English and Dutch call for SVO, it should be relatively easy to code switch at that particular point. Um, in these other conditions, where we have different orders of verb and object, and, and even subject, um, it should be more difficult to implement a code switch if you are a Dutch-English bilingual. So the point of this experiment really was to try and force people to do code switches at different points in time and see how they work around these word order constraints. Right, so uh, again this experiment worked with a picture description task and uh, yeah, <laughs> so on this picture there is a small horse giving a hug uh, to a girl. Don't ask me why, yeah, so this, it doesn't make any sense, but I guess it's nice enough when you have horses giving you hugs. That is, uh, I mean, there's a ton of things that can happen to you that are worse than that. So, um, all right, and uh, the stimuli that the participants were confronted with were things like um, context that called for SVO word order. Uh, so. <clears throat> For instance, um, there would be a linguistic stimulus saying, this is a funny picture because. And after because or uh, want in Dutch, uh, you would be expected to use SVO word order. <clears throat> there would also be context calling for SOV word order, a funny picture on which. Yeah, so the expected word order. Um, <clears throat> would be, uh, it's a funny picture on which the horse, the girl, hugs in Dutch. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, contexts uh, such as on this picture, so an adverbial in the beginning of the sentence that uh, should require you, so the Dutch, the grammar of Dutch would require you to start with the verb after that. So on this picture, hugs a horse, a girl. Okay, now, like as in the, the, the other picture description tasks that we've seen uh, just a minute ago, uh, there were these frames around the picture uh, asking uh, participants to use their different languages. So when they saw the picture in a red frame, the task was to describe the picture in Dutch. Yeah, so speakers would see, uh, okay, this is a funny picture because, go ahead, describe it. In Dutch. However, there were also conditions uh, with a blue frame, so <clears throat> you would see this kind of picture, a Dutch lead-in phrase like, okay, that's a funny picture because, in Dutch, and then the task would be describe that picture with at least one English word in the context that you've just heard. Right, so you can see how uh, in the second and third condition, you know, the context that call for SOV or VSO, you're kind of in a um, weird spot as a Dutch-English bilingual because your Dutch grammar tells you, okay, there's a certain word order that I need to use. And you know, okay, that word order doesn't really work in English. So what the hell am I going to do now? Yeah. <clears throat> so in the, in the first condition, 
uh, the hypothesis was that, okay, here there's really no problem. Participants will use SVO, either produce a, uh, a clause that's completely English or have a switch anywhere in the clause. Yeah? Because th uh, there's no violation of the equivalence constraint that would be uh, threatening here. In the second condition, the hypothesis would be that participants would prefer to use a full English SVO clause. Yeah, so that would mean that, right, it's, it's not quite right Dutch word order, <clears throat> but as far as English is concerned, it's okay. Uh, so that, it was hypothesized, would be better than mixing the Dutch SOV order with English words. Yeah, so it was hypothesized that speakers wouldn't be saying "een uh, grappig plaatje waarop um, a horse, a girl hugs." Yeah, I mean that sounds weird. Okay, and the same hypothesis basically for the third condition. Uh, here, participants should prefer to use SVO uh, as a full English clause rather than mixing Dutch word order with English words. Right. So far the hypothesis, what came out. Um, what did the participants do? Let's look at the easy condition first. So when there was a red frame around the picture and people were asked to describe the picture in Dutch, um, yeah, quite predictably, uh, the participants followed the cue uh, that was there in the context. So when the context asked for SVO, people used SVO. If the context asked for SOV, people use SOV overwhelmingly. And when uh, the context asked for VSO, well, people use VSO. No surprises there whatsoever. Um, now let's look at the conditions where people had to use some English. <clears throat> um, when the... <clears throat> uh, when the context asked the participants to uh, do something that requires SVO, no problem. We have uh, SVO mostly. Um, the interesting thing is what happens when there are contexts that require different word orders. Uh, here we're looking at the contexts that require SOV. Uh, here we still get a strong SVO preference and only, you see in the, in the red frame there, 10% switches uh, that adopt the Dutch word order. So apparently this is something that speakers really disprefer. You don't want to use a different language with the word order of another language. That is just, yeah, uh, it violates the uh, equivalence constraint. And then the same result sort of in the uh, last context that calls for VSO. <clears throat> um, again, there's a preference for SVO and in only 10% of all cases do we see VSO word order, so the Dutch type word order with the code switch into English words. Okay, so the basic take-home message then is that code switching follows the equivalence constraint. Uh, code switches occur at points where the combination of L1 and L2 elements does not violate a syntactic rule in either language. So the basic rule that people follow is don't mix Dutch word order with English words. A code switch should work in both languages. Use whatever overlapping patterns uh, you have in your respective grammars. All right. Um, on the other hand, when participants are not required to code switch, uh, they are completely in tune with their Dutch grammar, so they follow the cues for different Dutch word orders. Uh, but when they're asked to switch into English, they show a strong preference for SVO, which is the name of the game for English syntax. And a mixture of Dutch word order and English words is only observed in 10% of all cases, so under natural conditions speakers avoid it. If you torture them with pictures of horses and girls hugging each other and asking them to code switch, then okay, you get it some percent of the time, but even then speakers don't like it very much. Now, let's move on and look at the sounds of code switching. What happens <clears throat> uh, 
when people code switch? Is there some acoustic phonetic signal in the speech either before or after the code switch? When speakers produce code switches, are the switched words somehow affected by the pronunciation of the base language? Um, more concretely, when Spanish-English bilinguals use Spanish and switch into English, do the English words come out with just a tiny bit of a Spanish accent? Yeah, perhaps at least at the beginning of the code switch. It would seem normal that, well, <clears throat> if you're trying something new, something that's different from what you've done before, uh, it might take you a little bit of effort to get into a new behavioral pattern. And so it's a very reasonable hypothesis to uh, think that, all right, the sounds of a code switch might be influenced by the base language in some way. Let's look at uh, some experimental evidence here. Uh, we have a study by uh, Bollock and Toribio on English-Spanish bilinguals, and they had people read monolingual sentences and sentences with code switches. And um, what they looked at in particular were stop consonants and the voice onset time of stop consonants. Stop consonants are sounds like p, t, k, b, d, g. And uh, these stops in English and Spanish, they differ with regard to how soon the voicing of the vowel uh, sets in. Yeah? So that's maybe something you remember from a phonetics or phonologic, uh, phonology class. Uh, when I say something like Peter, uh, there's, a, there's a burst with the P and the, the voicing of E only comes in a couple of milliseconds later. Um, this is different across Spanish and English. Let me uh, show you something. Okay, first of all, this is the difference in voicing, voice onset time between K and G. With G, the voicing starts immediately. With uh, K, there is a little lag uh, during which you only hear some, some burst of noise, but, but no nice vocalic uh, uh, sound. Let me play you this. So this is me saying kip and gip. Kip. Gip. Okay. It's the same sound except for this uh, voicing coming in earlier with the g. Now, <clears throat> Um, what's the difference in VOT between English and Spanish? Uh, in English stops, we have, we have a voicing lag of between 30 and 100, 120 uh, milliseconds. And in Spanish stops, this voicing lag is considerably shorter. So um, a Spanish P might sound to you like a B. So here I've given you a sound of uh, a Spanish speaker saying, pronouncing the word uh, for bread. Bang. Okay, I hope you can hear that. Bang. There we go. So this, <clears throat> you would be excused for hearing this as ban rather than pan. Yeah, that's because Spanish peas have uh, shorter voicing legs, more voicing. Now, with regard to the experiment, uh, this translates into the question how bilinguals pronounce a code switching sentence with stops. Uh, so here we have a sentence that has three English words and three Spanish words. And the question is, do the stops have uh, quote unquote normal Spanish uh, voice onset times or maybe voicing lags that are a little longer than usual because they're influenced by English pronunciation? Um, or maybe are they even super, super short to contrast uh, between Spanish and English and make it easier for the hearer to identify that, okay, this now is Spanish rather than English. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, Bollock and Toribio uh, took measurements from uh, several speakers reading out sentences like these. So you see the underlined elements, those are the uh, stops that were analyzed and you see that there's a, a Spanish T and then there's an English T and there's an English K and um, so the first T is pre-switch and that's just Spanish <clears throat> pre-switch and then uh, the next T 
is the first English word. So this is right in the switch position. And you might expect, okay, is there some kind of Spanish influence at that point? And then lastly, there's the K from kids, which occurs post switch. So at that point, speakers might have gotten into the habit of using their uh, English stop sounds as they normally would in, norm in monolingual mode. So how does this play out? Is there a difference in voice onset time, pre-switch, switch, and post-switch? Um, and of course, also the order of English and Spanish was switched around in this design so that everything is properly controlled for. So here are some results. <clears throat> uh, we have um, English stops and Spanish stops across three different groups, early bilinguals uh, and then late bilinguals uh, L1 with L1 Spanish and late bilinguals with L1 English. And uh, the uh, well, there, there are four different <clears throat> uh, conditions. The first one is measurements in a monolingual uh, sentence that people had to read out. And here you see very nicely that in monolingual speech, Spanish voice onset times are much shorter than English voice onset times. So <clears throat> up here we see uh, monolingual Spanish and uh, we see voice onset times around 25 uh, milliseconds, so really, really short, the way we would expect them. For English, we get values that are a little higher, so around the 60 millisecond mark. And what's interesting now is, of course, what happens in code switches. So here we see uh, a comparison between the early bilinguals, the late bilinguals L1 Spanish, and the late bilinguals L1 English. And uh, you see that, well, there's not much of a difference between the early bilinguals and the L1 Spanish uh, speakers. <clears throat> but the late bilinguals L1 English, they are just a tad longer in their voice onset times. Yeah, so they maybe still need to practice the short Spanish voice onset times, although what they do is a lot different from what they're doing in monolingual English mode. Yeah. Okay, but maybe just a question of calibration. Yeah. <clears throat> then, uh, so in Spanish, there's really no great differences between the three measurement sites. If you look at the switch site exactly, or if you look at the pre switch, or if you look at the post switch, yes, there are little differences, but it's hard to say, okay, is you know one millisecond, is that really a difference? Probably you can't make a case that there's much of a difference between these different sites, pre-switch, switch site, and post switch. <clears throat> On the other hand, uh, when we're looking at the English data, uh, there, well, uh, there's probably grounds for saying that uh, pre-switch VOTs are a little shorter than the usual English VOTs. So this could be seen as an effect of anticipating the Spanish that will happen just a little further down uh, in the clause. Yeah? So the speaker is already preparing for these ultra-short VOT stops and this influences pre-switch English uh, stops that the speaker produces. So small effect, a small phonetic effect that we see in code switches. Now, um, <clears throat> the question was, when English Spanish bilinguals read sentences that contain code switches, does the base language somehow spill over phonetically into the pronunciation of the guest language? And the answer is mostly no. Speakers maintain rather clear, separate phonetic categories. And uh, this is good for the hearer. Yeah? Imagine how hard it would be for the hearer to not be completely sure, is this an English word? Is this a Spanish word? What am I supposed to make of this? Yeah? So that would make listening to bilingual speech really difficult. Um, so mostly speakers maintain their different pronunciations. And uh, this is a case of uh, yeah, audience design, if you like. However, uh, in this particular experiment, there was a small anticipatory effect so that uh, people pronounce stops slightly different in English um, when a code switch into Spanish is coming up. Summing up this video, 
Um, I've shown you this three-stage model of speech production. Conceptualization, you think of something to say. Formulation, you select words from your mental lexicon and you put them into a structure. And finally, you articulate that structure. Um, <clears throat> in bilingual speech production, we can ask ourselves whether it is selective or non-selective, but ultimately that is the wrong question because it's dynamic. It is situated on a continuum from fully monolingual to fully bilingual. Uh, languages can be activated more or less strongly, and, and this activation is also very time sensitive. So um, it can switch from being strongly activated to being a little less activated in very short amounts of time. And this is how we should think about bilingual speech production. Um, there are different factors that affect language activation, um, how proficient you are in a language, what languages figure in a given speech situation, uh, what topics of conversation you're dealing with, and also what task you're uh, supposed to achieve with the conversation that you're in. All of these can activate a language to a greater or lesser degree. And then lastly, uh, with regard to code switching, we've already seen in the last video that there is something of a base language effect, yeah, that there's a cost associated with code switching. And in this video, we've seen that uh, code switching incurs a time cost, especially when you're switching back into your L1, as uh, unintuitive as that might seem. Yeah? Um, but <clears throat> we'll talk about this in later videos, why this actually makes very good sense. We already talked about the rule-governed nature of code switching, especially the equivalence constraint, uh, which states that code switches occur at points where the combination of L1 and L2 elements does not violate a syntactic rule in either language. So design your code switches in such a way that the resulting sentence is syntactically well-formed in both of your languages. Of course, this is not a rule that you would consciously follow. Yeah? This is just something that speakers do, and they disprefer uh, code switches where this somehow does not work in that way. Okay, and lastly, we've also seen that code switching is relatively effortless and does not strongly affect pronunciation. So speakers keep separate phonetic categories. Uh, you don't, when you do code switches, you don't end up with a pronunciation that is sort of half Spanish, half English. Rather, pronunciations tend to be relatively clearly identifiable as either of the languages that are at play. And as I said, that's a good thing for hearers. Next time, we'll focus on reading, that is, um, the recognition of words on the page and uh, how bilinguals deal with that. There's also very interesting um, experiments done on that. And so I'm already looking forward to seeing you again when we'll talk about that. Till then, au revoir. See you then. Bye.